Welcome to Suncoast In Depth. My name is Brett Watson, and I'm joined here today by my good friend, Dr. Troy Doucet. And today we're kicking off a new series um, that I'm calling Solistic Self, Growing Into the Whole You. But what I want to do today is I want to talk about the, the emergence of what I think is a, a new spirituality that has kind of worked its way into, it doesn't matter what religion you look at, Mm -hmm. um, especially in the West, whether you're a Buddhist or you're a Hindu or a a Muslim, even a Christian, this, this, the spirituality that has emerged out of what I would say is a more data driven, um, concept of spirituality. And this has arisen out of, out of, uh, the, the research that's been done into near death experiences, um, regressive hypnosis, and to some extent, um, psychedelic therapy. So um, I asked Dr. Troy to sit and talk with me about the stuff. You've been reading a little bit of a book um, that I recommended. Right. So what do you think? I thought it was uh, very, very interesting. You know, obviously, you know, it's, I'm, I'll be the sort of the mitigated skeptic on, on the idea, but there's some really, really uh, interesting and salient points that I think um, – that are a part of this ongoing research yeah. and 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 practice, if you will. So, yeah. yeah. So I I haven't found a label for this, um, <laughs> and and I've read at this point. I think I've read eight books. You know, just last yeah. year on the topics of near death experiences and on uh, uh, regressive hypnosis uh, therapy. And nowhere have I found, they all talk about all the, all the common threads um, that exist between them. They mm-hmm. reference each other. Right. Um, especially the hypnosis, um, the, the books about hypnosis often reference, you know, Dr. Raymond Moody mm-hmm. and, uh, and his research into near-death experiences um, because of those common threads. But they never, they, there's never a label put on that religion and i guess because i'm a religion guy yeah yeah i like to have things categorized that way so i'm calling it um soul progress spirituality yep or solistic progress you 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 actually gave me that one solistic yeah. I like as opposed that. to holistic yes uh, as opposed to holistic, holistic yeah. yeah um so that's what i'm calling it so i guess it if if i were to define that that solistic spirituality or progress spirituality I would say that it is a, a modern 20th, 21st century um, view of the soul's progress mm-hmm. toward enlightenment mm-hmm. and or full union with divinity. Mm-hmm. Um, and this seems to, hinting on some of the common threads, this seems to come by way, this progress seems to come by way of um, things like multiple incarnations right. of a soul personality uh, into this physical world and um, in the experiences of those lifetimes, right? right. Um, and what makes it modern, what makes it modern isn't just that it's from the 20th and 21st centuries, but it's because it, it's, it is a data-driven spirituality because of the technologies that we've had and in the 20th and 21st centuries. And not only that, but the, we're also in this information age, right? Yep. So you have access to all this information. Yep. And, um, and the, and the, also with psychedelics, the common threads that seem to tie these things together in the form of a religious belief system That's right. that, um, I'm, as I'm, as I'm researching it myself is, like I said, it exists in all different you know, traditional religious systems. Uh, you can see it if, if you're talking to the right people. That's right. So, um, so that's kind of my definition of, of uh, solistic progress spirituality. All right, so when you, you read... Um, many lives, many masters. Right, so yeah. that's on the hypnosis side, right? right? So what do you think so far? You know, I, mean, it's, I asked you that already, but, you know, what, I think, you, what you stands know, out? You know, it, it, it follows this, this more, um, like, qualitative approach to... What, what we'd call like sociological studies, right? So they, there's a lot of data that's comparable to these patients who un- have undergone these hyp- hypnotic treatments, even psychedelic treatments. And it reminded me a lot of, um, 
I forgot the professor uh, from, he was the professor of psychoanalytic theory. He was a psychiatrist at Harvard who studied abductions of people to, um, oh yeah, to, uh, uh, what's his name? Oh geez. See, there were so many people who were having, mm -hmm. uh, like claiming to be abducted by aliens and mm -hmm. UFOs. And here's this guy at Harvard. Yeah. The uh, head of the psychological department. Uh, yeah, yeah, like the, the, the program's named after him at Harvard. And he said, well, this is too interesting not to study uh, because the phenomena is worldwide. And, dude, he was criticized and almost literally, like, lost, oh, yeah. lost tenure. But the, Harvard came back and they, they, they withdrew their accusations. And, and so th this is what it reminded me of, of you have all this phenomena, all these experiences of all these variations of people throughout the world of, of different socioeconomic backgrounds. John Mack. John Mack, that's right. Yeah. Gender religious affiliation and allegiance, you know, geographical location. Yep. But there were these common threads that all of these people who had never had really any, any interaction with each other that, mm -hmm. that emerged in these, in these, in, in these treatments. And many of them didn't even have a lot of interaction with what could be called pop culture concerning the UFO That's phenomenon. Right. That's right? right. And so what I saw were similarities between the, the the criticism Mac received with treating patients who had claimed to be abducted mm -hmm. and what this sort of near death experience or the hypnosis treatment for those who have like like you said the solistic progress um and that there's been a lot of criticism towards that but yet what we see are these sort of unifying connectors that many of these people experience sort of the same phenomena, sort of the same descriptives that that give, you know, credence to this thing. And one is, like in the book, this woman had claimed to have like 86 prior lives or something like that. Mm -hmm. And she knew the year, she knew the people. And some of the claims at first, they seem like outlandish. But then mm -hmm. you say, well, she's not the only one making this claim. Other right. people, other people are making these same claims who have no connection to one another, and so you could discount it as pure, you know, circumstances or happenstance or you know coincidence, or you could say maybe, like Max saw, maybe there's something deeper that's going on mm -hmm. that may hold or unveil some truth, even though our our cognitive, rational functionality doesn't accept it as quote unquote truth, whatever that is, you know? So that's yeah. what I found most interesting about the book. Even though I'm still skeptical of the thing, there are some undeniable tenets that, uh, that connect these, these, these events and phenomena. That at, at, at the very least make it very interesting. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And worth, worth researching, I think. Yeah. Um, now <clears throat> that is true, especially in the hypnosis therapy and the psychedelics therapy, right? Um, but I don't think that's so true when it comes to the near death experiences. The near death experiences are cases, thousands and thousands of cases at this point where, uh, people have been revived while they have been hooked up to modern, um, equipment, uh, technology that can, um, that know where their vitals are mm -hmm. at any given moment. And these thousands of cases, these people have been clinically dead. No brain activity registering on the, on the technology. So no brain activity that we know of, that our current systems can pick up on. And then they're revived. And this, even though there are near-death experiences recorded throughout human history, um, the the uh, the number of them has increased understandably because mm -hmm. of our technology to revive someone right and what happens though is these people have all these common experiences when they are revived they come back and they tell things like well i was outside of my body i saw what was going on in the operating room or in the emergency room and I heard this conversation, and so things that can be corroborated with yeah, yeah. people that were present when the person died. Not only that, some of these cases I've read about, they, they could tell um, what family members were doing in their homes. So they left their bodies and then went to see if their loved ones were okay. 
or in the waiting room while they were waiting for their operation, you know, but they died on the table. They left their body and they went and they, and they could tell those family members what was going on in that, in that room and the family members, can, they can corroborate that. That's not nothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild, man. That is. And it does sound outlandish and it is hard when you have, when you lean t- more towards the rational side of things. Um, I, I consider myself a skeptic too. But the more I read on, on near-death experiences, I just, in the whole constructed memory argument against them, that somehow we construct these memories afterwards, they just don't hold water, mainly because of the corroborated um, accounts right. of other people and because of shared death experiences that nurses and, and surgeons and, and doctors have had as their patient died they experience the out of body experience hmm. of the patient. Really? Yeah. Wow. There's, so there's a if if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there's a there's a huge database um, at the University of Virginia. They've been studying this stuff for decades. Yep. Uh, Bruce Grayson, Doctor Gr- uh, Bruce uh, Grayson, is one of the major contributors to that whole area of study. And not only that, they also have a giant database, something like twenty six thousand cases of reincarnation where they go and they research um, these children who are almost always under five years old uh-huh. who are talking about where they where they live or their other family or who they were before and uh-huh. and they go and they research um, that what the what the child is saying to see if there's any basis in reality um, so for example one one kid said I used to do movies I forget the guy's name now. I should have looked at this before we talked, but um, I used to I used to make movies, or I used to write or produce movies or something. And one day they're watching this documentary and uh, this picture of um, uh, I forget who the star was. He's talking with this guy on the on the movie set, and right there behind the other guy, the kid points to that guy and he says, "Hey, that's me." And so they look into things like, well, what did this guy do? What this kid has said about this guy's life, he, we know he can't read about it, right? You know, and and then they can they can they can look at the guy's life and say, well, is any of that true? And if you're interested in this stuff, the good news is, yeah, <laughs> they find a lot of truth in yeah. what the kid is uh, is saying about their prior life, right? So. Weird stuff, man. Yeah, that was one of the things in the book that she, the, the woman he calls Catherine, mm-hmm. has vivid descriptions of her prior lives yeah. and dates and names and locations, all kinds of historical references. Right, and and there was a claim. I wrote it down. One of the things was that you stay in your circles, which means like. You've been connected in the past to everybody in your circle that is in your current life as well. Yeah, so like your soul group. Your soul group. So like the doctor who's Mm -hmm. performing this hypnosis on her, Mm -hmm. she goes, yeah, I knew you as well, but you were like, which again, this is where my skepticism comes. She says, "You you were the Greek philosopher Diogenes. Yeah. And I'm like... What? Like, you know, like that was, that was pretty, pretty, I thought of you when I read that pretty yeah. wild. And I went, okay. Uh, but the claim itself is like the people that you connect with. Yeah. Um, were people who had some sort of, you know, significance in your prior lives as well from, from mm-hmm. being you know vastly important to maybe not as important, but they, you stay connected to these people in some way. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I moved to Florida after living in Louisiana, then California, then Texas, then here, and you and I are friends. So that means in some prior life, you would have had some sort of role yeah. in my life. I, I might have been your dad, or even or though your I didn't know you something. three years ago, I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't yeah. know I existed. I didn't know you existed. Yeah. So, so what you're talking about there is one of the very common things that come up right. in the reports of the that these subjects give of their hypnotic experience, and not only them, but also of near death experiencers. They also see if, depending on how long they're dead, actually, um, if they make it 
past some of the other common threads, which I'll touch on in a minute, uh, the, they very often will report that they encountered souls that they knew very well and that had been in their life, their current life that mm-hmm. they just passed from, um, or in other lives, they'll say. Yeah. So this is true in near-death experiences, and this is also true in, in hypnotic um, trance, uh, regressive therapy, mm-hmm. uh, when they regress into a past life and they experience the death process. Mm-hmm. So soul groups are, yeah, it's one of those common threads. Um, I can't say that for psych- psychedelics, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah I haven't seen that. Um, so some of the other common threads, right? Yep. And this is the one that I think probably is most problematic for a lot of Christians. So you and I are Christian, right? Yep. Um, it seems to me that when you talk to Christians about reincarnation, y- you might as well be talking about Lucifer. Yeah. I mean, they just get freaked out. Yeah. yeah. And it is true that, um, you know, traditional Christianity does not embrace reincarnation as, as legit. Yeah. It depends on who you talk to. But, um, you know, there are, there was a Catholic scholar I read recently who, um, and, and a notable scholar who said, uh, that he, he didn't see any reason to, to reject it as heresy or anything like that, um, based on the biblical, um, account. But traditionally Christianity rejects the notion of reincarnation. And so it's understandable that Christians tend to have a problem with that whole oh, yeah. concept, you yeah. know? Um, what does that mean for Jesus? Like, what did he accomplish then if I'm just going through all these lives to, um, to work, work this stuff out on my own? Right, you know? right. Um, that's, that's usually the hangup that I run into with them. Um, it's not an issue for me, to be perfectly honest, mm-hmm. because I don't really buy into the evangelical view of salvation. So that soteriology isn't yeah. the one that I ascribe to. So um, I, I, have no issue with reincarnation. In fact, there's a lot of it that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, when you think about the average lifetime, 70, what is it now in America? 75, um, for a man. That's a, that's a blip, man. Yeah. That's a blip to work things out. Yeah. And the reality is that Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's right. Um, and I'm not, I also don't, endorse, you know, a works righteousness either. I want to be clear about that, but I don't see a problem in the scriptures with reincarnation. What do you think? Oh, it's, for me, it's, it's a, it's a difficult proposition to, to fully accept, but, but so is, you know, heaven and hell, the way that they've sort of been framed for our Western minds, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they sound great until you really start thinking about it. You yeah. know, even heaven, like, I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. I gotta, I have to exist again forever. Like, dude, I'm 49 and I'm like, I'm okay with death. You know, like yeah, even yeah. at 49, I'm like, yeah, you yeah. know, give me another 25, 30 years, you know, to much to the chagrin of my wife who want, you know, wants me to live forever or mm-hmm. whatever. But, of course. But even then, you know, even the, all of these doctrines are, you know, I'm highly suspicious of in, in, in some way only because I don't know, you know, I don't know. Um, we we have people who've experienced um, what they would claim to be hell. You know, there's there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people who said hell was burning and blah 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 blah. And the, I, I remember when I was growing up in the evangelical community, it, it was more of a spirit filled, charismatic church. Uh, a book came out. It was called "Your First Twenty Minutes in Hell." <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this woman goes on again. It took me three hours to read the book, so it was much more than twenty minutes, but. She described hell as like this body, like the body of hell and the head was this and the arms were this. And it was very, very vivid and very, very uh, fearsome. And yet our our pastor would teach on this book as if it were, you know, yeah. if, if it were, uh, you know, scripture. Something to build dogma on. That's right. Yeah. And, and everyone was okay with that. Everybody yeah, was okay wild. with that. Yeah, like yeah. There, there was a special room in the heart of hell for pastors so if wow. you were a pastor, you, and dude, people were like, that's right, that's true. But, you know, it just seems we sort of have this, this, this epistemic flexibility to, to, to accept things we want sure. to accept and reject things we want to reject. Yeah. But the idea. But that's is, worth guarding against. Oh, for sure. You yeah. know, and, 
th- this idea that somehow I am reincarnate, like so to re flesh mm-hmm. into something is hard to accept because I know what my flesh is. Like my flesh, you know, the moment I bo- I'm born, I, my flesh begins to grow, but yet deteriorate at the same time. Mm-hmm. But I also know that, you know, the things I see with my eyes, you know, I can close my mind and still imagine imagery and, and scenes without the use of my eyes, you know, the, those, I can conjure up those things in my mind. Yep. So there's more to me than just flesh. Yes. There has to be yeah. more than just flesh. Now, how does that energy, that vibration, that consciousness get re-energized or recycled? Um, it, that's for me is the mystery, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and I think one claim is it gets recycled back into flesh. Yeah. In some way. Yeah. Uh, whereas there are certain mystics who believe, right, that you get recycled back into just the energy of the, the universe that is God or mm-hmm. what have you. And so for me, the, the mystery is, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, but all of the options so far, I'm not really cool with, you know, if, if I'm speaking just candidly. Like, I don't want to come back to Earth, dude. You know, I don't yes, want to. exactly. I don't want to come back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm good. Yeah. You know, my 78 years or whatever, however long I live, like I'm, I'm be cool with that. I've experienced it. I've had a great life or whatever. Have you studied any of the, um, Kabbalistic, uh, scholars? Yeah. Some of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. So you know? reincarnation for them is just a given. You know, yeah. They, they, uh, they take no issue with it. At least the guys I've read. But for me, I feel like if, if it does happen, I don't want to know about the previous lives, you know? Well, right. And that's kinda, another... That's another common thread. But I'm also like skeptical of heaven, just again, from from just a personal standpoint. Dude, I don't want to live forever. Like, you know. What does that even mean? Yeah, like yeah. when we, we sing that song and we'll sing again a hundred billion times yeah. and you sing Amazing Grace and when yeah. we've been there 10,000 years, yeah. we've only yeah. just begun. Oh, crap. When I first met um, Chris LeMaster, my yeah, yeah. buddy. He, uh, he was only like, I don't know, 12 years old, you know? And even at that age, you know, he's a thinker, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he would say to me, Brett, it just really freaks me out that I'm going to live forever. That whole idea, I just, it keeps me up at night, you know? Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. So, reincarnation... The, the reality. First of all, I want to touch on the hell thing, right? So, yeah, yeah. twenty minutes in hell. Um, there are there are also books written by people that say that they've experienced that, who yeah. had a near death experience, and that they. Um, I I've had the privilege of of sitting down at dinner with with Dr. Raymond Moody a couple of times, and um, a group of us, and we asked him, you know, how many of these cases, these NDEs that you've studied, what would you say is the percentage that are hellish experiences? Because I had been told that it was around 4%. He said, it's nowhere close to 4%. Really? Yeah. He said, it's not even 1%. It's not even 1%. Really? Yeah. Almost all near-death experiences are a transformative and beautiful experience. Transformative in the sense that there is a long-term positive change in that person's life and their outlook on life. Uh, long-term positive change on their, um, the way that they view the world mm-hmm. and other people yeah. and their relationships and so on. Um, there's a, a new level of, of, it's a whole new level of profound yeah, yeah. to them. But life. isn't that, isn't that, again, according to the book I read, that you've read eight recently, mm-hmm. I've read one totally, mm-hmm. you know, on these, the near death experience and. The, the treatments. And again, I'm familiar with like you know, the wheel of the moksha, like within Hinduism, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And that you're supposed to somehow break that cycle through the process of learning. And, um, and, and in the book, that seemed to be what the claim was, is that the way we escape this cycle of rebirth is sharing the knowledge of it and then helping people become their best selves. Part of it, yeah. And so... My question for you is because again you have more like experience in you know actually like you've had 
hypnosis done to you mm -hmm. and you've sat with dr moody who's like like probably the most you know senior guy that's alive at this point on, on the granddaddy of ndes that's yeah. it what happens when you break the cycle of reincarnation according to some of these the, the theories do you become one of the masters at that point helping and guiding yeah souls out of the reincarnation cycle is that sort of the, yeah. the theory the, the, the common story that comes back through from these subjects in deep hypnosis and from many near-death experiencers is that you are entering these incarnations as um as something that you planned uh before you came into this life and others with you for their needs for your needs as a soul and the ultimate goal is to is to ascend to the point of perfect union with God, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they have different names for that. They they perceive it differently depending on what their uh, religious background is. You know. Right. right. But that's what the, they're t talking about—the ultimate, the or the divine. You know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there are there are souls according to these accounts. There are souls that progress to the point where they no longer incarnate. They don't. They never. They don't in flesh again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they just continue to progress in spiritual reality. Or a transcendent yep. reality, transcending this the physical plane um, through other dimensions, even. So this is also, if you looked at Kabbalistic stuff, this they go into great detail about this. Mm -hmm. uh, that there are twenty four rungs on a ladder, you know, right, right, right. And you're ascending through worlds, or um, uh, what's it called in in Aramaic, um, spheros. Mm -hmm. um, these worlds of of progression, right, mm -hmm. where you are returning to perfect union with God. And I would even say um, that it would be a more perfect union with God. So I wouldn't say it's returning to what we had, let's say, before the biblical story of Adam and Eve. Right. Um, I would say that it's better than that. I would, I would say that C.S. Lewis was right when he says there must be something better about a fallen world than a world that never fell to begin with. Right. Um, because otherwise, who are we worshiping? Right, right, right. right. Like, it has to be the goal, right? But that's but isn't that the point of it? Um, fallenness for me isn't a bad thing. No, it's it's not for it's, me either. It's, it's it's this notion, like Roar says all the time. I don't I don't learn to be more Christ like by getting it right. I learn that's by right. getting it wrong, and it opens the horizon for learning. And that seems to be again one of the staples of of near death experiences. Mm -hmm. Of hypnotic therapy, of psycho, you know, psychotropic therapy, mm -hmm. is that we're here, we go through these stages of reincarnation to learn, mm -hmm. to continuously learn, and it's when we get to the point where we're getting it right, then we can kind of move on. Yeah, and that explains a lot. Like one of the things I wrote down was is that some people are born wiser than other people. Mm -hmm. because they've gone through more progress in their soul progress than other people. And we say this, we say this just sort of, uh, you know, like cliche sometimes, like, oh, that kid's an old soul. Yes, yeah. And you're like, look at that guy. Like, the kid's just like all astute and, re you know, yeah. Re re yeah. Like revered and just kind of like, he's not acting like a kid, you know. Like when you look at Autumn's son, you know, that you had up on stage with you. Yeah, yeah, time. yeah. Um, you look at that kid and, and you talk with him, you interact with him, and it's like, yeah. That's the kind of kid that you would say, kid's an old soul. Yeah, I talked to him. He's on his 187th life progression, he told me. No, I'm just picking up. <laughs> you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sorry man, cough. I didn't mean to make you laugh. But there, there seems to be, even with these quote-unquote masters, or yeah. their process... Some of these near death death experiences have have said things like they were in a classroom or something like that. Oh yeah, like that's, that's they're, they're in pretty, school. Pretty damn common, you know. Yeah. They're yeah. they're in school. Like explain that. Yeah, so uh, one that's one of the common threads that I'm going to touch on in the class that we're doing um, on uh, Thursday nights, um, and I, I call it the University of Heaven. <laughs> um, but but it's because so many of these near-death experiences, especially those who have died and they were dead for a good while, you know, like yeah. um, Pam Reynolds is the case of cases. Uh, she died 
because she had a brain aneurysm at, the, at her brain stem that was inoperable. She went out to Phoenix, Arizona uh, to, a, uh, to do experimental surgery where they basically told her, we might be able to save you, but we'll have to kill you first. And the reason they said that is they had to drain all of the blood out of her brain. So the argument of a, oh my you know, gosh. <laughs> I mean, th- this woman was, you know, she was out without blood in her brain. She was brought to a, temp- a body temperature level that would kill people. I mean, yeah. you, you would die of hypothermia, right, to preserve the cell integrity um, without dropping it so low that you'd have uh, crystalline damage right. to the cells and the DNA and so on. Um, and they were able to revive her. And she lived until 2012. She died. Um, and she is one of those that in her story, she, she came upon this institute of learning like this. She described it like a university, you know, where people were learning. Um, uh, Dr. Moody's um, uh, good friend that kind of l- whose experience launched his interest in near death experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, that guy came back and said that Jesus took him to an institute of learning, a university, where he saw souls just absolutely engrossed, just, and Jesus actually told him that, yes, some of these souls are too engrossed. They're, in, they're involved in their, in their learning to a fault. Mm-hmm. Um, and many, many others that talk about a place of learning where you are working on your progress even while you are in between incarnations. Um, uh, the, the hypnotherapist, Dr. Uh, Michael Newton, coined the term um, life between lives, mm. uh, regression mm-hmm. therapy. So a lot of the regressive work that he did um, when he was alive is, is with uh, regressing people to a, a recent past lifetime right, and then to the point of death and what their experience was like dying in, from, in that life and ascending into the spiritual plane. And in thousands of cases, again, yeah. they describe something so similar, man. Yeah, man. Um, so anyway, you asked about, uh, did I stray? No, no. From the it was topic? about the school, the school of heaven. Yeah, so there's an ongoing learning process that seems to take place according to these stories. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting because, like, some of the things that I've, I, I pointed out and after reading some of the book, I just made some notes for, for discussion. They seem to give, like, these answers to some... To, to, to some scientific questions, you know, why are some people born, you know, wiser than other people, mm-hmm. you know, where there's no like genetic link to like genius in their families, but yet they are. And, yeah. And another one was this idea of like, why are some people born with sort of a uh, propensity to, to, to be alcoholics or whatever. It's, yes. it's almost as though the book says, like, if you don't, if you don't check your vices, you're going to carry them with you into the next yes. life. Yes. Yes. And so why do I have this propensity when there's no historical, like, yeah. And so like, what, what do you, what do you say to that? I mean, that's, it's, and you don't have to be born into the same gender or same socioeconomic no. status, which if you believe that, then it, it kind of like elevates Jesus's teaching. Like we just, we're all related, yeah. you know, regardless of yeah. your gender, race, ethnicity or whatever. Again, that's one of the common threads. So people come back and they say, yeah, we're all one. Yeah, and so they lose racist uh, ideologies. They lose all that stuff. They um, and they lose even a dualistic view of reality. Yeah, it becomes instead that all is one. All emanates from the singularity that is God or the divine. Seems like the most the most important thing that these stories carry, in, at least in my interpretation of it, is that. Life, whatever that is, is endless. Like it does not end. It's it's eternal. We our spirits never die. Um, why is that like important? Is that point back to the oneness of all things? Like that's the one thing we all share in common. Is that the soul is eternal? Or I think that I mean I personally believe that, and so I think that's part of what it means when we talk about the oneness of God. Um, I think it's interesting that the Jews. Um, from an early age, they memorized the Shema. Yeah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? And when you listen to Kabbalistic or other Jewish mystical scholars, 
um, they, they very often touch on that, that that is of supreme importance. Even if you can't wrap your mind around it rationally, that oneness of all things, yep. they still want it ensconced yeah. in the human mind, in the Jewish mind. Yeah. Um, that oneness is of supreme importance to them. Yeah. So much so that they reject the notion of the Trinity and, and right, so on. Right, right. Um, which I, you know, we we would think is a misrepresentation of the Trinity. But, but we see this, we see this, this evidenced everywhere. Like even yes. in in ourselves, we are, we are we are comp we're compromised of thirty three trillion cells. Yeah, all doing different things. Yeah, skin cells, brain cells, eye cells, heart cells, liver cells. Like we 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 we're composed of thirty three trillion different things. Yet. It's a good analogy because it, it stem all of those stem from stem yeah. cells. That's it, right? Yeah, the stem cell can be placed as we're finding out more and more in a diseased liver, and it will take on the properties of a healthy liver to replace yeah. the diseased cells. You know, right. um, we can grow organs with stem cells if we give some kind of catalyst so that it knows what to do with that information. It's super interesting. It's man. so wild. It's so yeah. crazy. And perhaps the, the most profound discovery that we've made concerning the oneness of all things is, um, is in physics. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the experiments that have been done on what they call um, uh, entanglement. Yeah, 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 that's right. So entanglement was, you know, hypothesis. Einstein called it, you know, spooky action at a distance. He hated it, <laughs> right? But it was the hypothesis that particles are, are entangled in such a way that if you change the spin of one particle, no matter how far away the other particle that is entangled with it is from that first particle, it will change its spin simultaneously. That's right. Right? That's right. And so it just drove Feinstein crazy, even on his deathbed, <laughs> right? Um, but what we've been able to do in more recent history is we've been able to experiment to see if this is actually the case. And so you'll hear these physicists, I'm, I'm definitely not a physicist, but uh, you'll, hear them, you're, you'll hear them talking about this stuff and they'll be just like, it's like there are particles that are a part of your body that are entangled with particles in the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah, yeah. It's all one. Yep. It's all one. That's crazy. It's a unity in diversity. Right? Yeah. Because obviously we see all the diversity. Yeah. Um, and, and I just think that's a beautiful view of reality. That's right. Uh, it, we're not questioning the fact that there is evil, what we have labeled as evil in the world, and that we should do something about evil. Yeah. We don't mean oneness in that sense. Like, well, there's really no evil, you know. No. 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 But... Ultimately, it's all one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the, again, that's a common thread in yep. near-death experiencers and in hypnotic regression and in psychedelics. Yep. Definitely one of the common threads in psychedelic. So here, here's my last question, mm -hmm. because I'm very interested in, in time. Uh, but I'm, I'm with St. Saint, Saint Augustine when he says, I understand time until I, I start trying to talk about it. Um. It seems that in the book that I read that whatever time is, you know, because time is obviously relative, deeply relative, you know, speed yeah. of light. And yep, absolutely. Sp sp yep. Speeds of cars at particular That's all proven stuff. Is. There is no question. Yeah. But, time is relative. But when we talk about, like, the, the oneness theory mm -hmm. and this idea of near-death experience and reincarnation, and that time is not measured in seconds, months, years. Time is measured by the lessons one learns within their given time. Like that's how time is, is, is somehow measured. What, that, do you, what, do you, uh, what do you think about that? Well, if I understand you correctly, I think that that jives well with um, the reports of these subjects and you know, hypnosis subjects and near-death experiencers, also psychedelics. Um, you know, Crystal Astor um, has used psychedelics therapy for years now and <clears throat> he he told me about a recent experience that he had um, like it maybe last year and in that experience he flat out told us you, you weren't there because you were in Dallas but you know we get together and yeah, yeah. talk about this stuff um, he told us sitting at uh, at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings he said I was there 
for years, Mm. years I was there. So that when I came out of the influence of the psychedelics, I can sit here now and tell you, no, I was somewhere else. My body wasn't, but my consciousness was somewhere else and it was there for years. Now, you know, y'all don't know Chris LeMaster, but he's, he's a hyper rational dude. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he's, he plays the devil's advocate on all the podcasts I've ever done with him and and so on. He's good at it too. But, um, but he, he just flat out told us, he said, no, because you know, O'Hara was like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, did you know that your body was on that bed, you know, where you had the therapy? Yeah. Yeah. And yes, I knew my body was on the bed. (laughs) Yeah. I was conscious of that. That's wild. But my consciousness traveled somewhere else and it was as real or realer than us sitting at this table in Buffalo Wild Wings right now. What is that? That's right. That's just crazy, man. But the oneness is one of the things that he has taken from that therapy. Uh, The oneness of all things. Yeah. He doesn't really question that because of those experiences. That's amazing. And that is a common thread in all those different, you know, in all those different pools of research. Yeah. It's going to be an awesome class, man. Yeah, it's going to be, be awesome fun. class. And again, this is a very different spin from what we typically do. It is. For, yeah. for your classes that you yeah. lead. You lead them very well. And um, well, Thank you. I don't. And I, I know this is a particular area of not just interest for you, mm-hmm. but like you've immersed yourself in in exposing yourself to the the experience of, of yeah, that. And so I did. So Thursday, I'm, you know, I hope people ask you about that experience as yeah. well. To- I'll be happy to share it, and I'll probably share it on this in this format at, at some point. Uh, what I want to do to close this out is I, I want to. I'm still a skeptic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, same. so yeah, I'm not. I'm not promoting this spirituality. I am identifying the spiritual phenomenon that's taking place. It seems throughout religious traditions as a result of this the data that's been derived from these studies, you know? Right. Um, and, and looking at the common threads with just a lot of interest, Yeah. but it's not that I believe. So I, do I believe in reincarnation? Well, I can't say that. Right. I, I, I would just say, I don't know, right. you know? Um, so I want to be clear about that. We're not trying to indoctrinate anybody with, you know, yeah. Eastern philosophy or anything that's like right. that or religion. So Suncoast has made a turn towards, yeah, no. <laughs> no. no, but what is so cool about Suncoast is it is a place where you can talk about these interesting things and, and not feel like you're walking on eggshells about it. That's right. Right. So thanks for doing this with me. Yeah. Love it, man. Awesome. Yeah, we'll do some more. <laughs>